Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night midweek service. So glad that you're with us. It's been a beautiful day and uh, we enjoyed some time outside with the grandbabies today and just had a good time. Feels like spring and I'm more than ready for it. I don't know about you, but for me, spring brings hope. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having winter behind us and moving forward into a new season. Now, if you've been around Missouri long, you know that this is but a tease, yeah. and uh, yeah. so buckle up. I, I told somebody if I wouldn't have moved more wood into the garage, uh, you know, we, we'd have a snowstorm. If I didn't go get some more wood, I, that, that was almost the last of what I had um, there. If I don't go get some more, well, you know what will happen. So I'm going to go get the load, and it'll sit there all summer. It'll be nice and seasoned for next winter. And uh, anyway, so thank you for being faithful in your giving. Uh, Kirk's going to wait on you for tithes and offerings, and so thank you very much. Um, many of you have switched to the new app already. I helped somebody do that today. If you're giving online um, and you're having troubles with that, please call me, talk to me, see me. Um, I, I'll be able to do it easier in person than I can uh, over the phone We're trying to walk you through it, but... Uh, I'll help you get transitioned. Uh, remember, once you get over onto the new app, you need to cancel any recurring giving that you have set up on the old one, or you'll be giving twice. And uh, by the 1st of April, the old General Rush Give to Life Church will be gone, and everything will be on the new, uh, the new Tithely app. So uh, if you have any troubles, talk to me, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your blessings. We love you, Lord, and we're so thankful that you take care of us. And uh, Lord, we know that every good gift comes from above. It comes from you. We know that you're our source for everything in this life, and you've called us to be stewards of what you give us. And part of that stewardship is giving back to you a portion. So receive our gifts, our tithes, our offerings tonight. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While he's doing that, uh, remind you again, we have a guest speaker this Sunday morning. A uh, young couple, Williams is their last name, uh, Trina is her name, and his name slips my mind at the moment, but they're going to Japan, and uh, you, if you know Margo and I very well, you know we have a special place in our heart for the nation of Japan, the country of Japan, and the Japanese people, that's where we served in the military, that's where we met, that's where uh, we were married, we were married by Assemblies of God missionaries that we're working in Japan, so um, we're excited to have them here this coming Sunday. March 8th is calm, so that would be next Tuesday or this coming Tuesday, so keep that in mind. And are you ready for this? March 13th is Daylight Savings. Spring forward. Yeah, well, one of these days we'll get this whole thing just done away with and stop flipping it back and forth. But the good news is, uh, you know, we'll have more daylight to deal with. And, you know, earlier, later, the days are getting longer already anyway. But uh, the bad thing is, is that we lose an hour of sleep this time. So fall back, we gain one. Spring forward, we lose one. So anyway, keep that in mind, March 13th. Uh, that's coming up quickly. Are you ready for the wonderful names of God? That's where we are tonight. We're continuing uh, with another... Uh, of the expanded, if you will, Jehovah names. You'll recall the name Jehovah came from the name Yahweh or the word Yahweh, and we will see that in tonight's name uh, and the name Jehovah, you'll recall from a couple of weeks ago, means I am the existing one. I am the existing one. For tonight, uh, our name tonight is Jehovah Shalom or Shalom. Um, you know, I always wondered, you see in the Bible movies and stuff, and they said Shalom, you know, did people really say that? They do. And it, while we were in Israel, we heard it uh, quite frequently. And uh, so Jehovah Shalom, and it means the Lord is peace or the Lord is our peace. So let me read to you the text, <clears throat> excuse me, tonight. Uh, and we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. Uh, these will not be on the screen, 
the internet was down when I got here this evening to start putting things together for tonight. And so when it finally came back up, I told Margo, I said, I'm, we'll just give you the, the address and uh, you'll have to listen while I read or follow along in your own Bible. Uh, time just not, did not permit to make 24 more slides for the message tonight. So I'm reading from New Living Translation, Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauder, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people um, of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land, destroying the crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat. Sounds like a news report, <laughs> right? They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts and arrived on uh, droves of camels too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites, and then Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Let me take a time out there. Uh, any, any folks in the room, readers of Ted Decker? Okay. This makes me think of his circle trilogies and some of the other things, you know, when the hordes would come in and the wars that were good against evil and all. When I'm reading this, I see a Ted Decker novel. So uh, anyway, verse 7. When, uh, let me read 6 again. Israel was reduced to uh, starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord... Uh, because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. <laughs> We're going to talk about that tonight. I thought that was kind of funny. I'll, I'll explain. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God, you must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. <laughs> then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Oash the, of the clan of Abizir. Probably massacred that. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> Verse 13, Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. <laughs> then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least of my entire family. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He, he answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat, and with a Basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket, the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. And the angel of God said unto him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. I, I didn't make this connection before just now, but does that sound familiar? Remember the the... Uh, prophets of Baal, 
and they you know, poured water over the offering and everything. Okay. Uh, and Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of, his, of the staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all that he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. And Gideon did a happy dance. No. When Gideon realized it was the, uh, the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord rep replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yah Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah, in the land of the clan of Ebezer, Ebezer, to this day. Let's pray. Lord, help us tonight to uh, glean what it is you would have us to, to know and to, to receive from your word. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless all that's said and done in this place tonight. Let us leave here with a new knowledge and a new understanding of who you are, the Prince of Peace. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I jump into my notes, for a little trivia, do you realize that this, this place, Ophrah, is where Oprah got her name? Story goes, her parents misspelled it on her birth certificate, and so she became Oprah instead of Ophrah. There you go. That was for free. Huh? Yeah. What is peace? Well, definition according to the dictionary is freedom from disturbance. It's tranquility. It's mental calm or serenity. Right now, with all that's going on in the world, we're thinking a lot about peace. That peace being a state or a period in which there is no war or when war has ended. Listen, God is all of that and so much more. So we're going to do things a little different tonight. We're going to grab a few uh, key passages, key phrases here and talk about those for a minute. And then at the end, I'm going to make some application of all of this to our lives. So before that application, let's walk through some of these key points in Judges chapter 6. Starting in verse 1, and it says, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Here's what you need to know. If, I, I, I caught this uh, a while back in one of the times when we were reading through the Bible, you know, every year, every year, every year. And I kept seeing this phrase. And so in Judges, I started highlighting it and marking it. Number one, number two, number three, number four. The number of times that we see just in Judges, this phrase, and the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. We're in verse or chapter 6 of Judges, and already this is the fifth time in the book of Judges that it says the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> there was a pattern, <laughs> and it wasn't a good one, right? <laughs> they just couldn't figure out how to stay faithful to God. Sound familiar? We see it all the time. People in and out, you know, uh, all, all hell breaks loose in their life. They're, they're, you know, absolute chaos and turmoil and no hope and nowhere else to turn. And so they come back to God and everything gets good and everything's going fine. And the next thing you know, they're right back in the same old place. We've seen this just recently in modern history in the United States when, uh, when the Twin Towers were struck and our nation came under attack on our homeland and those towers fail, fell, people flooded the churches. <laughs> Many churches did big building programs and bigger sanctuaries and everything, and three years later, all the people were gone, you know? And so that, that happens, seems like any time these, these big uh, traumatic or um, disastrous events happen, people flood back to God and cry out to him. It's a vicious cycle that Israel was in, turn to God, 
repent, live this faithful life for him in a, in a period of time, begin to grow cold in their faith and in their commitment, and then fall right back into their old sinful ways. And the majority of the time, that old sinful way revolved around idol worship, for the most part. Following the ways of whatever people were oppressing them or holding them in captivity, or that were just there living where they were, they were easily influenced by their neighbors. Listen, I'm all about going out into the world and finding people that don't know Jesus, that are bound in sin and caught up in sin, and, and sharing with them the good news message of the gospel. <clears throat> but I'm here to tell you tonight, you better be under the leadership and the direction of God going into uh, evil, wicked places, and um, you, you better be covered by an anointing of the Holy Spirit under his direction to be there, and you better be prayed up and, and fasted up and read up and filled up with the things of God before you walk into those places, because if not, you'll end up just like the children of Israel. Right? You know, uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so Israel was often influenced by their neighbors, so time and time again they would take the consequences or face the consequences of their sins, and God would allow some people group to have their way with them. This time it's the Midianites, and we see the Amalekites, and, and the people to the east of Gaza were there. So, so numerous, such a huge number of people that they couldn't even be counted. It looked like a swarm of locusts. It said the, the camels were like herds of camels coming, couldn't, couldn't even count. They were absolutely ravishing the land and leaving absolutely nothing to sustain the Israelites, no grain, no livestock, no nothing. <laughs> there was, they, they stripped the land bare, the scripture says. And the people were hiding uh, because they feared for their lives. And in the story, a man named Gideon is thrashing wheat in a wine press, trying to hide his harvest from these invaders. And the story makes me think... Uh, about some things that we talked about just last night in our James uh, Bible study discipleship class. And uh, so let me bring that to your attention. James chapter 1 verse 6 says, Do not waver for a person who with divided loyalty is, an unsettled, is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Here's the deal. These folks are the most... Uh, um, are, 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 they're constantly wavering in their faith and in their commitment to God. One day they're up and they're serving God. In a matter of time, they're down and they're back worshiping idols and up and down and up and down like the waves of the sea divided in their loyalty to God. With their mouths, they proclaim Jehovah is their God. But with their actions, well, their actions speak louder than their words. And again, sound familiar? There's a few phrases that you're going to hear repeatedly tonight. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of news flashes and sound familiars, okay? So they are continually, the children of Israel, these Israelites, they're continually being tossed about. But to their credit, somehow, some way, they always come back to a place where they cry out to the Lord. And that's what happens here. Point number two, verse seven, they cried out to the Lord. Just like in the times past, they finally come to a place where they can take it no longer. They cry out to God. They have hit rock bottom. They have, uh, they're facing starvation. There is absolutely no way they can save themselves. The text doesn't say it here, but the cry would have been, help us, God. And it would have been a cry also of repentance because God sends somebody here to tell them what the problem is here in just a moment. We'll get to that. Something happens in this cry. Something happens in their heart and in the mind of, of a man when, when they in, begin to endure the consequences of their sin for a period of time. 
We don't like it. We don't like to be uncomfortable, right? And so here's what happens. Either uh, in, in the midst of, the, of dealing with your conse- the consequences of your sin, you either repent and turn back to God or harden your heart and move further and further away from God. Uh, that's really the only options. Have you ever known someone that was uh, ha- always learned their lessons the hard way? <clears throat> I mean, my skull is thick. Right? I've always had to learn my lessons the hard way. Most of the time, once it gets through my thick skull, I get it. <laughs> but sometimes the journey is not always fun. That's who the Israelites are. And honestly, it's who most of us are. They endured a lot of hardship uh, throughout their existence because of their lack of obedience to the Lord. Did you hear me? Because of their lack of obedience to the Lord. The Bible is full of all kinds of, if you will do this, God says, then I will do that. Ifs and thens. If you do this, then I will do that. Listen, it's not rocket science. And yet our human nature seems to pull us back into sin. Here's here's the first news flash. God shouldn't be the last person that we cry out to. But that's what's happening in this case here. I mean, they're under uh, oppression. They're they're being uh, devastated and consumed by their enemies Uh, They're at the point of starvation, not sure if they can even continue to exist. And finally, they cry out to him. Yes, we need to remember this. God is always present. Yes, he is all-knowing, but he is also a perfect gentleman, and he will not come barging into your life. He is waiting on you to come to your senses, just like the prodigal son did, and cry out to him. And let me say this. It's okay to be emotional When we cry out to God, it's okay to even get loud. Sometimes I think that getting loud, getting emotional, more for us than it is for God. And also the devil sees it, and I I think he begins to tremble, think, oh no, they're waking up. (laughs) Right? We see these kinds of expressions throughout, throughout Scripture. Listen, we serve a big God. He has broad shoulders. And he can handle the intensity of your cry. Ooh, that's good. The people cried out. What happened? The Lord sent a prophet. The Lord sent a prophet. I didn't mark the verse on that. Uh, It's verse (laughs) 8. And I put this to start this point off. Oh, great. Just what we need, another preacher. Right? They cry out to God, God sends a prophet. If if that's our response, then we miss the point. God sent a prophet. God is answering the cry of the people. He is answering, uh, sending the answer through a prophet. And here's another news flash for you. Listen, true men of God don't get some cheap thrill out of pointing out the sin that's in your life. If, they, if that's what they enjoy, if that's their purpose, then they're not a true man or woman of God. True men of God are used by God to help us see the issue in our life that is standing between us and God. That was the purpose here of this prophet. <clears throat> the man of God points out their faithful, uh, points out our uh, faithlessness um, before God and points out his faithfulness to us. He points out their idol worship, but he points out that God is the same, helping them to see how and why they're in the situation that they're in. God, newsflash, not my notes, God is in the business of reconciliation. He is in the ministry of reconciliation. His desire is to see you restored and transformed into the perfect creature that he created you to be. He's he's not that God that we sometimes get this picture of sitting up there in heaven, you know, spying out the land, looking for somebody that's messing up so he can squish us like a bug. That is not my God. 
My God loves us. He chose us. We're his. He wants us to be restored. And so that's why he sends the messenger, the prophet. We need to wake up and pay attention. I had a conversation with someone today. <clears throat> he made a comment about how challenging people can be. <laughs> in, in, okay, y'all got to love me after I say this, okay? Because Jesus said so. There's this little joke in the ministry. Joke. That ministry would be great if we didn't have to deal with people. Right? Ministry would be fun if we didn't have to deal with people. And so anyway, he said in this person that I was talking to in our conversation, he said uh, that he had been talking with an individual at their request for the last five years concerning the exact same issue. <laughs> and, and I didn't think about it then. I just thought about it now. I should have said, now you know how God feels. <laughs> but, and he said, for the last five years, he has given this person the same answer and for the last five years, the person has refused to implement the ideas the person continues to share with them. And they can't understand why nothing changes. I haven't used this word in a while. Let me throw this one at you. Let me give you a thunker. Okay. Here's the, here's the thunker for tonight. If you do the same thing the same way, you're going to get the same results. If you keep going back to somebody asking for help with a situation in a, in, a, in a trial or a challenge or a sin or struggle or whatever it is in your life, and that person keeps giving you the same biblical counsel, godly counsel, and you don't change anything, hello. Next, point four, after the prophet, then the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. God is calling Gideon to be the one that will bring about the manifestation of the answer to the prayers. You get that? He's calling Gideon to be the one that, that, that facilitates the manifestation of this answer to prayer. And Gideon responds like most of us do. Uh, God, uh, uh, I, sir, I think you got the wrong person, <laughs> right? You got the wrong guy. Gideon res Gideon's response, first of all, uh, is that if God is with us, if God is on our side, if he's fighting for us, if he's doing, if God is with us, then why are all these bad things happening? Well, he missed, he missed the, the, the response of the prophet, you know, that says, this is why this is happening, because you're sinning against God. And the second thing for Gideon, and they, after he said, you know, if, if this is of God and, and God, this will, if God, God is with us, why is all this happening? The second thing he says is, I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to do what you're asking me to do. Gideon says, my clan is the weakest, my family. So he says, my family's the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least of all of them. I'm the weakest of the weak. You don't want to pick me. Gideon is saying, I'm the guy that gets picked last to be on everybody's team. You don't, you, you don't understand. You don't want to pick me to do this. Listen, God has a way of choosing the weak and the least to do the greatest. Amen? Newsflash. <laughs> We've got a lot of those. We've got a lot of those. Not only has God called, but he has also uh, either equipped you or will equip you for the task that's at hand. The thing that he wants to do in you. Listen. If God begins stirring you and moving you to something. If it's genuinely of God. He will. He is either already put it in you. Or is going to put it in you. To be able to do it. He won't ask you to do something. That he's not already. That he's not ready to empower you to do. Well. well I'm too shy. I'm not smart enough. I've made too many mistakes, God. You're making a big mistake, God. Really? You, you really have the audacity, the audacity to tell God that he's making a mistake? That he doesn't know what he's doing? 
I understand. I've been there. I've done that. I bought the t-shirt. I ran from God and his calling for 10 years. But let me tell you what. He, he took me from that kid that was a behind the scenes and wouldn't give the, the oral report in English class in high school. I'd take a zero instead from that till you can't shut me up. Right? I heard somebody preached a message that went an hour and 40 minutes from the time they started till the time they end not too long ago. So you're blessed, huh? No, but that I, I could have listened to him for three hours and 40 minutes. <clears throat> so anyway, um, listen, it's not about what I've done. It's about who he is. It's not about who I am. It's about who he is. And we see this all throughout scripture. I've got a list of 20 people and there's more in the scriptures that uh, just jacked things up. Their lives were a mess. They, they did some of the craziest stuff. Some of them are so crazy, I'm not even going to read them to you. I'm just going to mention their name, all right? L- l- listen to some of these names, and they'll pop up a few at a time there on the screen. <laughs> I, and I pulled this list off the internet, so this isn't just me, you know, being so smart, okay? Listen to this. Adam, <clears throat> the first man was a blame shifter who couldn't resist peer pressure. I mean, he caved to peer pressure just like Eve, <laughs> the first woman, couldn't control her appetite. Should we say that maybe she had the first eating disorder? <laughs> right? Then there's Cain. What about Noah? The last righteous man on earth at a time and... and, and <laughs> What do we see in Genesis 9? He, he gets drunk and sleeps naked. Wow. Abraham, the forefather of our faith, let other men uh, walk off with his wife on two different occasions to spare his own life. Sarah, the most gorgeous woman by popular opinion, let her husband sleep with another woman so that he could have a baby. She could have a baby for him. And then she hated her for it. Hello, Lot and Job and Isaac. What about Rebecca, the first mail order bride? I love the explanation on some of these. Turned out to be a manipulative wife. Jacob, who out wrestled God, was pretty much a pathological liar. And then Rachel and Reuben. What about Moses, the humblest man on the face of the earth? Numbers 12 but a very serious problem with his temper at times. Then we issues with Aaron, Miriam, Samson. I like, I like the way they put this one. Samson, who put Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura to shame, was hopelessly uh, immersed with a disloyal wife and ended up taking his own life. Eli, what about Saul? The first uh, and powerful king of Israel was apparently... A, a psychotic, uh, was psychotic with a manic bursts of anger, episodes of depression, deep depression, trances of paranoia, paranoia, and he committed suicide as well. David, a friend of God, yet concealed adultery with a murder, or at least tried to. Samson, or Solomon, the wisest man in the world. <laughs> I'm not even going to read on him. You search this list out and you can see it. With rare exception, all of the kings that followed after Solomon had mammoth issues in their lives. The prophets, even as they spoke the word of God, many of them struggled with impurity and depression and unfaithful spouses and broken families. Listen, God has a way of using... uh, our our brokenness. He does. So stop saying you can't and start trusting God that you can. God says to Gideon, I am with you. God speaks into your life. I am with you. And Gideon still isn't sure. And he says, well, if it really is you, show me a sign. (laughs) Hasn't that been our go-to 
throughout the history of the human race. <laughs> it's, not, it's not enough for Gideon to hear the voice of God. He asked for a sign. Over and over again, mankind keeps asking for a sign. Asking for a sign. Listen, asking for a sign means your faith is too weak to believe or that you doubt the faithfulness and ability of God. Did you get that? It means your faith is too weak to believe or you doubt the faithfulness and ability of God. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 4, a wicked and an adulterous generation demand a sign. We've got to grow to a place in our faith where we don't need a sign. Jesus is our sign. <laughs> Here's your sign. That just came to mind. Here's your sign. If we've got to grow to a place where we don't need a sign. And, and I put this in. I put it in bold letters. Listen to this. If you wait to find yourself in the fire to test your faith, you will most likely fail. Simply the word of God spoken into our lives is should be sufficient to move us to obedience. Gideon wants to make a special offering to the Lord, and if it's received by the Lord, then he'll know that he knows that it's God who is speaking to him. You heard the story. He prepares the goat, the bread, places it on the rock. The angel touches it with the tip of the staff in his hand. The offering is consumed by the fire. And instead of Gideon saying, okay, God, I, I see it's you. You gave me a sign, and so I'll do it. No, what's Gideon do? He becomes fearful. I have seen God and I'm going to die. The Lord speaks to him and says, it's all right. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. Calm down. As my son used to say, calm down, cracker dog. I don't know what that means. I hope it's not bad. But he used to say that all the time. Just calm down. It's going to be all right. And finally, Gideon gets it. He builds an altar to the Lord and he names it that place Yahweh Shalom, Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. Break those two down. Jehovah, I am the existing one. Shalom, peace. I am the existing one of peace. I am the God of peace. Here's the deal. God has been giving, has been Gideon's peace all along. Gideon had just not been able to see that for himself. When I first got saved, we sang a lot of Maranatha music, right? Those of you watching online, you're not going to be able to do this with us because we can't do this music over the streaming. So you'll have to go to YouTube and find the song and sing it for yourself. But we used to sing a song that said, he is our peace. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. Cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. He is our peace. He is our peace. The simplicity of the word. God is our peace. You can cast all your cares, all your worries, all of your concerns on him because he cares for you. And it really is that simple. He is our peace and he cares for us so much that we can cast those cares, those worries, those concerns upon him. So what's the application? I, I just got a lot of random thoughts here and then a few, three, three passages of scripture, four passages that I'll give you and then we'll pray. First application, don't wait until you hit rock bottom to cry out to the Lord. Hello? Israel was facing starvation. And, and then finally... Somebody said, you know what? Maybe, maybe we ought to call out to God. Don't wait till you get to rock bottom. Second, stop expecting God to bless you when your life does not reflect his plan or purpose for you. God won't bless your choices that are against his will. What does that mean? 
broken down. You cannot worship the world and the things in it and expect God to bless you. He has called, listen, he has called us to live lives that are holy and righteous, separated and set apart for him. For him, not the things of the world, but for him. Well, I need to get out there in the world and tell all these people about. Listen, you better make sure yourself that you're that you're sealed <laughs> in him before you go worrying about other people. If you're going to cry out to God, oh, listen to this one. I like this one. If you're going to cry out to God, be ready for the answer that he gives you. <laughs> and then do it. Sometimes we ask for things and we don't even stop to think about the implica- I'm going to use the word implications of what we ask for because consequences kind of has a negative connotation to it. So I'm going to use that word, the implications. How is that going to affect me if God gives me what I ask for? Sometimes we get things that we asked for and then we got them and we're like, mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe I didn't want that after all, right? If you're going to call out to God, be ready for the answer that he gives and then be responsive to it. Here's a couple of scriptures I want to leave with you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, day, yesterday, today, and forever. So if he was peace for them and he'll be peace for you, he'll be peace for tomorrow. If God offered peace to his children thousands of years ago, we can rest assured that he offers peace that same peace to us today, tomorrow, and the next day. His peace does not change. He still offers peace even in the midst of our storms. Jesus knew that his followers, both present and future, would face challenges and dangers in their ministry and in life, but he didn't want them. He doesn't want us to live in fear. He said, my peace Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't let it be fearful. John 14, 27. Jesus instructed us to not live in fear, but instead to live in peace. Why would he tell us to live in peace and then not make it possible for us to live in peace? Finally, Jesus reminds us, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world. Glory. This life will never be just carefree and and easy in our own strength and knowledge and power and ability. The only way we can have genuine peace is as we surrender to Christ. In his presence, we have the power to overcome the stress of the present uh, or anxiety of the future. Final scripture, and then we'll pray. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, we are to cast all our cares and anxieties on him because he cares for us. He is our peace. We're going to pray and then uh, after I'm done praying, Margo will stop the, the, the video, the live stream. And the, the words for that Maranatha song are going to pop up on the screen, the, the music as well. And we'll sing through that uh, one time. And then uh, we'll consider ourselves dismissed. Listen, as rapidly as our world is spinning into chaos, more so than ever before in history, we better know where to find peace. Amen? Lord, I thank you tonight that you are my peace and that I can trust in you, I can rest in you, I can place all the cares of this world on you. You're able to carry them, I'm not. So Lord, help each and every one of us tonight to learn to trust you, to rest in you, to find peace in you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, those watching online. Come see us Sunday morning.